I am delighted uh, today to introduce Jason Brett Searle to the Lazarus Initiative. Uh, the segment is called um, RK Types, the Epigenetic Engineering of Humanity. And Jason's uh, latest documentary has been deemed too controversial for film festivals and general screenings as it touches on topics that are becoming um, very taboo. RK Types uh, deals with a theme that you won't find uh, elsewhere, and the, the agenda to epigenetically engineer our thoughts and behavior by hacking our bio biological selection strategies. So this film um, introduces us to RK selection theory and then details just how it's being used to bring about social changes that benefit a tiny minority to the detriment of everyone else. Well, we all know what we're talking about here. I believe that this film by Jason is of great importance to us all regarding the engineering of humankind by using known biological principles, in particular, R and K sexual selectivity strategies. Uh, so make sure that you do watch and pay close attention. Um, before we dive into the specifics, I want to just introduce the maestro himself. And Jason Brett Searle is an English writer, filmmaker, NLP master, and licensed hypnotherapist with multidisciplinary in interests in autology, authentic spirituality, psychology, law and sovereignty, true healing, disruptive technologies, organic permaculture, and conspiracy fact. His two books on spirituality, Kissing Achilles Heel, The Joyful Unmasking of Delusion, and the other one is Abide as That, Ramana Maharishi and the Song of Ribu. They both received praise from such luminaries as Ramesh uh, Balsika and Muji, uh, the great master. He has also written books on cryptocurrency, the standard catalog of uh, cryptocurrencies, 2018 and 2019 editions, as well as chapter a chapter in Ralph Metzner's uh, book of the psychedelic mushroom, uh, unpronounceable word for me, Tionanakatl, Sacred Mushrooms, Mushroom of Visions. His first documentary film, Mind Your Mind, a primer for psychological independence, was an official selection at the London International Documentary Festival and is currently distributed by Journeyman Films in the UK and Film Media Group in the United States. Uh, Jason is the founder and main driving force behind Maybug Productions and now lives on the south coast of Spain, sensible chap, with his wife and two sons. Jason, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you for having me. It's a, so, it's a uh, dive straight in. Tell us, how did the documentary come about and walk us through it? Um, okay, so I've been involved in these themes for some years now. I guess I was thrown um, unwillingly down the rabbit hole sometime around 9 11, as perhaps many of your viewers were. Um, and that was the sort of bucket of cold water thrown over me uh, and waking me up to certain reality that I was not aware of. And uh, from then on, I spent a lot of time investigating truth from fiction, the world presented with the world as it is. Um, that led me into studying NLP. I studied NLP with Richard Bandra in London. And coming out of the, the studies of NLP, it was very eye-opening to be standing in line in a bank and reading the, the sort of blurb on the wall and the posters and seeing, oh my God, there's a nominalization and they're using ambiguities and it's mind reading. And, you know, I had this whole toolbox of, of, of terms and knowing the methods that they, they were using to manipulate us and to, to gain our consent. Um, and so on the back of that came my first documentary, Mind Your Mind, which is about the psychological methods of manipulation. And it goes into sort of politics and advertising and, and the different themes of how we're being led astray or led down a particular path by by the elites or the, the publicists or whoever's applying these techniques. Um, so this documentary was really a sort of natural outgrowth of that. Obviously, if um, psychological manipulation, if you can, the deeper you 
reach in someone's psyche, the more powerful that manipulation is going to be. And that's so that's why we so often see themes of death and sex being touched upon in 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 um, in publicity, because these are deep elements of the human psyche. And if you can reach there, then you're more likely to to gain sort of some sort of control. What deeper element of us is there than biology? You know, so in my in my search down the, the, the rabbit hole, I came across this very uh, amazing book. It's called The Evolutionary Psychology Behind Politics, and it's written by an anonymous, anonymous conservative is the pen name of the writer. Um, I was, before then I was unfamiliar with the whole RK selective theory. This is a biology, biological theory. And, um, and it introduced me not only to the theory of RK selectivity, but also showed how there is an amazing lineup between the R type uh, being or manifesting psychologically, ideologically as liberalism and left leaning politics and uh, K type leaning to the right and more conservative. Um, so that just it was it was mind blowing to 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 grasp that concept and see how beautifully they line up. Um, and then, of course, you go away from from taking on that knowledge and you start looking around you and you start seeing people, you know, and, you know, news items and policy makers and all these other aspects. And you start to see how um, there is a clear correlation between the R and K selectivity strategies and our ideologies, in particular, our political, you know, predispositions and tendencies. Um, so it was out of that then, you know, I, I was quite familiar with the grand conspiracy and the agenda that's coming from the top down to sort of engineer society. And um, I kept seeing that all of these elements of the agenda are designed to stimulate and push us further to our selectivity, and take us away from K and towards R. So it was um, it was on the back of that that the, the idea for the documentary came about. I thought it was very important information. I hadn't heard it spoken about anywhere, um, especially the themes or the extrapolation that I'd taken out of the basic idea of this book. Um, you know, there was a there's a Canadian psychologist and professor um j philippe rushton who wrote some books about our case selectivity and he related to ethnic differences and this sort of thing and he was you know destroyed for doing so uh, you can't it's it's completely taboo those sort of things nowadays as you well know um so there aren't many people who have dealt with this and no one as far as i know who's dealt with it in the context of, of this documentary and i just think it's a it's fascinating, it's fascinating. and and um Fabianism, Tavistock Institute, mm. all of that stuff, which was really the um, um, psychocultural and intellectual uh, progenitor map for this fucked up status quo today where the left is so far left it falls over itself. Uh, it's pure Luciferianism in as much as it's, um, it um, ultimately leads to idolatry false light worship where mm -hmm. kids are um, programmed and they're culturally and socially programmed from very young age not just kids but principally uh, to to believe the opposite of that which self-exists self-reveals self-fulfills which is pure truth so you you've beautifully um you beautifully designated this subject at the perfect time what does R stand for? What does K stand for? What, what is the etymology of this term? Okay, so the terms come from, from an equation that deals with population dynamics. So R refers to the rate of growth and K refers to the carrying capacity or the optimum um, number of animals for any given environment. Um, so that's where it originates from. And it comes from, the first mention of it comes from an ecologist, Robert MacArthur, and the naturalist E.O. Wilson in their 1967 book, uh, The Theory of Island Biogeography. 
And it's referred to as a theory, but I really think that once you get a sort of basic grasp of it and you start applying it to your day-to-day -day observations, it's far more than a theory. It's, it's a clear observation of behavior, um, you know, observable both in the animal kingdom and manifested through our psychological, ideological predispositions uh, in human societies. And so on the one hand, as a species, uh, human beings are very case selected, if not the most case selected species there is. Um, you, this, this is determined by the long gestation period of our, of our babies, the extremely long period of baby, infant, toddler, child that, uh, that a human being requires in order to be, uh, to be able to stand on their own feet and to be able to take care of themselves. Um, so there's a massive investment of energy, time, and education in creating each human being to make them suitable for society. So that in itself is extremely case selected. But within the case selection of the human species, there's, there's quite a wide spectrum of possibility towards R and towards K. So that's what I'm sort of dealing with in this documentary and this constant movement away from k and this push towards r and the so reason are you are you also um dealing with predestination or, or fate and free will is that part of the subject matter i suppose it is to the extent that we're um we perhaps consider ourselves to have more free will than we actually do in the sense that uh, when it comes to things like politics or ideologies, we tend to think that, you know, our self is in the mind and we are the, the authors of, of, of these ideologies. We are the decision makers when it comes to, you know, whether we have a, a left leaning, right leaning or whatever sort of political inclination that you might have. We tend to believe that it comes from our intellectual reasoning upon these things yeah. whereas once you start looking into the sort of the underpinnings our bio biological uh, imperatives that sort of uh, are beneath uh, these as, as sort of lesser manifestations that sort of float above it then you start to see that um, there are other factors and, and I suppose a great part of what I wish to communicate in this is you know, knowledge is power and it's through knowledge and the knowledge that we're being manipulated and the knowledge of how our biology manifests as ideology that we can, um, we can grasp free will to a greater extent. Uh, the more we're the leaf in the wind being, you know, battered this way and that by, by things that we are ignorant of, the less free will we obviously have. And, you know, uh, if you don't make the decisions of, of, as to your life, then someone else will. And that right. seems to be kind of what's going on at the moment. Right. A lot so of decisions are being, you know, okay. outsourced and we're just uh, suffering the consequences unwittingly. So predictive programming is, is, a, is, is a huge component here. And um, if a child by the age of 15 has um, seen and heard subliminal messaging, uh, three million times that coca-cola tastes great then that's embedded that's become neural pathway 101 um and every so when you talk about media billboards media television radio um all of the uh, iconography that um, proliferates in the world how do we begin to uh, address um the reversal of this syndrome of predictive programming when everything uh, on the high street, everything from the moment you wake up in the morning um, and get hit with a blitzkrieg of computer screens and telephone screens, and and then you're on the tube train or you're in the airplane, and this constant, constant subliminal messaging, and one wonders how does how do we begin culturally, societally, um, civilizationally to move into a recursion there? Any mm. any ideas? It's no small task. Um, I think it's, it's at the individual level, 
it's once again, it's the acquisition of the knowledge that allows us to liberate, liberate ourselves from the manipulative influence of these things. So, so on the one hand, you have the psychological knowledge when it comes to these techniques that are being used to program us. Uh, the more we become aware of these techniques, the less uh, influenced by them we become. When it comes to the sort of the biological manipulation and, and engineering that's going on, um, I think there are, once you start to see the behaviors that are particular to R and the behaviors that are particular to K, what we see going on in this subliminal programming is, is a facilitating of the R behaviors and a suppression of the K behaviors. So this is how uh, genetically, epigenetically, they're turning us one way or the other. Um, so, I mean, if we look at some of the different RK differences, we can see that basically the difference between them is a trade-off between quantity and quality of offspring. So this is the basic polarizing factor between R and K, okay? So R type goes for quantity over quality. They have lots of offspring. Hopefully some of them will make it through and be able to have their own babies, right? K on the other hand is, quant is quality over quantity. A small number of offspring, a lot of investment, parental investment in educating, training and, and whatnot goes into each members of the K society. Um, so this manifests in many different ways. The, the quantity of offspring is higher in R species than K species. The gestation period is shorter in R species than K species. The age of sexual maturity is younger in R than K. The sexual frequency of R is frequent. The sexual frequency of, of K species is infrequent. The activity is promiscuous, multiple sexual partners of R, for K, it tends to be monogamous. So you can already see that um, taking, taking the grand sort of plan of the way we've been moving for the last 50, if not more years, everything is facilitating easier sex, more sexual partners. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's leading to more um, the promotion of our sexual behaviors and the suppression almost of K sexual behaviors, you know, yeah. the, the don't sex before marriage. That's fuddy duddy. That's sort of old. And, and, um, we can do away with that in modern society or, or the, the importance of families being under undermined. And so you can already see that there are certain behaviors. The more you indulge in our behavior, the more you will epigenetically uh, move yourself towards the R side of the spectrum and vice versa. So knowing these things, we can start to see when they're being applied to us. We can start to see through the policy makers when they're facilitating abortion or lowering the age of consent or all these legislative measures that are facilitating one and undermining the other. And in the personal sphere of our lives, um, you know, look at the sort of no fap society of young men nowadays. I think it's it's really admirable uh, who are starting to see the the ill effects of free, easy pornography and, you know, the 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 deleterious effects of too frequent masturbation and and losing their sexual power. And and so there's a, there are already the sort of the natural balance is is pushing on this on this yeah well that that yeah. counterpoint geometry always comes in um by the grace of god it always Absolutely. comes in to right to right the ship but indeed uh what we're talking about here does um go a long way to explaining and rationalizing the uh, perversity of the civilizational wheel um especially in the last um few hundred years or couple of hundred years almost certainly from the kind of you know the correcting of history which we we now more or less um can identify happened within the last 150 odd years this grotesque rewrite of of history 
and um, the perversity that was um, imposed or installed as a kind of civilizational software subsequently moving into the very kind of constricted Victorian and Edwardian uh, type stranglehold, uh, which, which went so far in one direction that it ultimately erupted into, you know, World War I, um, which is what's going to happen when you perversify human nature and constrict it at the collective level to such a, a, a grave extent, which clearly happened. And then that, you know, kind of ricochets from World War I into World War II. Of course, we have Sabbatean elements and midnight Masonic elements orchestrating that um, blood cultist kind of rollout of, of the fabric of reality. Um, and we've had systemic war, disease, and poverty, uh, poverty ever since. So that's become the, the underpinning to this uh, contemporaneous so-called civilization. Wheel. And, you know, again, one wonders how we, we apprehend it. Seems to me that um, in the first instance, it, it, we, we would need to designate who are they? You know, what one, one is always tempted to speak in terms of, um, you know, the status quo, the establishment, the them. I've maintained for an awful long time that they can only ever manifest as a, um, as a kind of contrary aspect to the unresolved um, elements within one's own psyche. Otherwise, that wouldn't it wouldn't manifest in the field as being the other. So, mm -hmm. in your in your view, what 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 is who or what is the they, the mm -hmm. archaic element that we constantly pit ourselves against? The contrast against which we define our own purpose and light. Well, that that's interesting. The first sort of introduction to the documentary. That's I, I put that out as the kind of the pillar of my argument that I'm not going to even sort of argue. It's like there's a group of powerful people on this planet that collude uh, for their own best interests against, often against our own best interests. And I sort of leave that as it's not the scope of the film to, to uncover that or to look into that. There are plenty of people who have commented on that. Um, but it definitely is one of the, presuppositions that the whole following argument of the documentary leans upon. Um, so who are these people? That's a very good question. I think in, in this case, anyone who is making decisions for you can be considered them. And that can be on a local personal level, or it can be the, the top of the pyramid and the, the sons of Cain, controllers of this dimension, whoever they might be. Um, so who is, the real question is, and coming back to the point of free will that you made before, how free are you? How free is your free will? How many of the decisions that you make in your life are truly arising from within you as a, as a sovereign entity? And how much of it is, subtly being trickled down via psychological manipulation, epigenetic engineering, and all these different techniques that these institutes like the Tavistock Institute have been um, indulging in and studying for God knows how long. So we know their knowledge is uh, very well developed. Um, they're, they're very uh, sophisticated in their means of of acquiring consent and applying these uh, this knowledge uh, upon us. So um, to what extent are we sophisticated in response? So to what extent are we taking the time to do the due diligence and find out how, how this whole system is working, why it is the way it is, and um, and how as individuals, because I think at the end of the day, the only way you can approach this is as an individual. You know, I think there are so many movements that are trying to co-opt the energy for change and move it into a forum of, oh, you know, we have to wait for some sort of critical mass. And, and, and while, while that, might, that might well be happening, that's a, that's a secondary part to the process. Yeah. Uh, the only one that we have absolute control over is, is ourselves. And, and by 
uh, taking this sort of information seriously by taking doing our own due diligence into it, finding out more about it, taking the disciplinary action of standing firm against it, you know, so, so we might have fallen into a lot of these habits that are, that in the long term are not providing us with anything. And they're actually just um, the, the sort of the matrix sucking our energy away. And once again, pornography and, and, and Jason, if you don't sexual. mind, I, I want to jump in and just, just uh, up, up, the, up the dynamic of the conversation. Um, it is the harnessing of the harvesting of the um, sex magic, mm. the, the um, unwitting kundalini force um, within the extraordinary divine capacitor that is a human being. Mm. We're born with this capacitance to transduce, transcode, um, and then broadcast limitless amounts of force, of energy, of life force, of prana, chi. And the Sabbatean overlords or comptrollers um, have been aware of this. The Babylonian priesthood have been aware of this uh, for millennia. That. And this describes why or explains much of why the perversification of our culture um, planetarily and this sexualization, over-sexualization, over-stimulation, the pornographicization, as you, you inferred uh, earlier, quite rightly. So all of that, amping that up and maintaining this constant um, over-stimulated sexualization of our planetary culture keeps everything in this state of um, kind of kundalini rising, except it's not the individuated consciousness directed kundalini that, that we would, you and I would prefer. It becomes this collective morass of, uh, of uh, unwitting life force that then through the power of totemism, of symbology and of the mind, of ideation, the human being also has the capacity to manifest reality in the field by projecting ideas into the field backed up by that life force that, that, that's coming through them as capacitors, misdirected or undirected. But it can be directed by the controllers, and that's the point. So yeah. this collective, consistent, cyclical, um, rinse cycle process of engendering the overstimulation of, of di directionless kundalini and then mind-fucking humanity into projecting uh, the images into the field, into the quantum of war, disease, poverty, conflict, antipathy, all of those things. So that's really the feedback loop, right? And we're trying to now break that. You are trying to break that. I'm trying to break that. The apprehension or to apprehend the, that, that unwitting uh, subliminal subconscious processes. Firstly, can you just describe in layman's terms, what is the distinction or the difference between genetics and epigenetics, just so people fully understand what we're talking about? Okay, so one way to look at it would be genetics is, genetics is the software, the running software. But as we all know with any software or any app that we might have installed, we can activate or deactivate aspects of them. So the activation or deactivation of aspects of our genetics is epigenetics. So we, 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 we come with certain givens, which is the genetic code, right? And our behaviors, the, the typical, you know, dialectic between nature and nurture, our behaviors and our environment are forever turning on or turning off aspects of that code uh, and the more that we look into genetics, the more we're finding that what is determining our fate, you know, both uh, biologically when it comes to the uh, development of disease or even psychologically, would be the epigenetic factor over the genetic factor. So when genetics was first sort of discovered, there was this predisposition towards genetics being the, the, the be all and end all of explaining who we are and why we are the way we are, you know? And the more it's been looked into, uh, the more we're coming to the conclusion that it's actually the epigenetic 
the aspect that's more important. So what's being turned off, what's being turned on, um, and what are the behaviors and the environmental factors that lead to that turning on or turning off of, uh, of your genetic predispositions. Uh, and that counts for disease. You know, we, we, we keep finding that it's not so much that uh, a person or a family line will have a predisposition to a, to a disease. They'll have certain family traits or habits that are indulged, you know, um, generation after generation that keep turning on or off the same switches, which then lead to, you know, the development of certain diseases. And, and um, so, yeah, the basic difference is the turning on or off of aspects of your genetics. But ultimately, we do have that control through the understanding of our behaviors and our environment. And OK, so let's talk about the uh, obvious imperative and importance um, in each of us of, of identifying the uh, failures in familial patterns and then using consciousness to break those patterns, um, genetic patterns, predispositions. And so the importance essentially of transmuting and transcending um, negative uh, familial or genetic patterns. Speak about the importance of that. Well, well, in the context of RNK, I think it's when we observe nature, we see um, in the short term, there's an urge to homeostasis, right? Sort of dynamic equilibrium. If the body gets too hot, then certain mechanisms kick in to lower our temperature. We sweat and so on and so forth. Uh, when the body gets too cold, other mechanisms kick in to raise the body temperature. Homeostasis is where it's at, finding this sweet spot of balance um, that allows for optimum um, sort of uh, uh, life force, no? So, so when it comes to R and K, it's the same thing. We're seeing a certain balance that, that, is, um, that is more productive for the human being and the human society. So, in, you know, throughout this documentary, I'm, I'm, so it, it may come off like I'm attacking the R strategy, and it's not really. It's, it's sort of corrected at the end of the documentary, where I, where I talk about the fact that if, if we were in a world that was pushing K, 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 and and repressing R, then this documentary might have come out the complete opposite, and I might have been, you know, uh, uh, sort of fighting for the other team, so to speak, because once again. At the end of the day, it's about the opportune balance between our R tendencies and our K tendencies. The problem is now that we're being odd, odd, odd all the way. And, you know, it's, it's taken us to a point of degradation. And, and like you say, regarding our sort of sexual energies and the pornographization of, of, of our world, it's it's um, dissipating our vital energy. And if we're not the controllers and the directors of that energy, then someone else is. Right. So it's being harvested for other purposes. Right. And that's um, it. I mean, we, we create the vacuum. Um, we're the ones who permission the absolutely. vacuum. And, and this Any is the that you're not making is being made by someone else, whether you know it or not, you know. Well, this is the dynamic I want to really focus a little bit on, the business of absolution, because the true power of the human being is to A, recognize one's, ultimately recognize one's own misdirection and to recognize one's own folly, to recognize the trajectory of one's own soul's journey, um, steered oneself to this perfect point in time, right here, right now. And everything that manifests on the radar screen of my life is my architecture is my orchestration, my engineering in that sense. A sovereignty 101, consciousness 101 can and will and must only emerge on the premise that I recognize there is no such thing as a victim ever, ever, ever. Because to suggest that there is a victim is to be completely drunk on the R factor 
mm-hmm. is to believe in that Fabianus Tavistockian, um, you know, nanny state. Um, I deserve better. Oh God, what have I done to deserve this? All of that shite, um, psycho emotional guff comes out when we fail to step up and stand fully in our, uh, uh, in in our full sovereign consciousness and recognize that I was never a victim of anything ever. I was always steering and orchestrating the trajectory of my soul's expression. But oftentimes, all too often, I was eclipsing myself uh, from supernature. So I was not able, the great witness was unable to, to filter through the egoic forms in that sense. But here we are, in the year 2022, uh, about to depart the fiction of time altogether, certainly in our age, I I suspect you would agree with me, we're moving beyond the grip of time altogether, Mm -hmm. moving now into this this great um, vista, this this quantum horizon, where we move into limitlessness and into true uh, prosperity and abundance. And so leaving all those linear formats, do you see in the in the um i don't want to say days weeks months and years ahead but that's all i can suggest do you see let's say in the next generation um cycle of seven years between now and 2030 uh what given the exponential um uh, speed that we've been now um dynamically shifting at psycho civilizationally and that obviously takes into account billions of individuals as well who are moving into an ind- individuation. What do you see um, happening in the next five to seven years? Um, that's a that's a pretty big question. Um, what do I see happening? I think we are definitely in the midst of a very powerful transitional period. Um, obviously, the the sort of the the controllers who have been for the most part in power on this planet for a long time i definitely see their power being um being shattered and being um undermined in many different ways so so once again i think we come back to the if nature if the homeostasis of nature is artificially pushed one way there will be a a rectifying movement back at some point um and i hope and i think that we are currently seeing the rectifying movement back of being artificially uh led for so long so so like you say all of these aspects that we've been sold on like you know false scarcity and and um they've been they've been dividing us with every possible you know religious ethnic uh um every division that they can find they've been pushing at us and i think there's a there's a response now and a a rectifying movement of nature that's pushing and in the context of the r and k pushing us back towards k yeah like i say this sort of the no fap uh community there's there's a very strong conservative community in in the younger generations which is once again they've kind of they've had this free-for-all sexual liber- libertarianism pushed at them for so long that it can only go one way from there which is swing of the pendulum the other way well hopefully hopefully not in a sense because one i mean but the the the, the pe- picture that I just painted a moment ago was really one that was more hopeful that we will all together trans um, transcend this uh, binarized dualistic and polarized um, existence of you know the pendulum swinging from left to right for me that's the whole point of now well it's the pendulum and the spiral once we if we look yes, at it it's very pendulum, good. but ultimately very good. It's a spiral very so good you are I like that you're apparently repeating certain cyclic uh, left and right, black and white uh, duality, but ultimately there's a movement vertical. A vertical. Very good. That, that's exact. That's exactly so right. Often, yeah. You've just described the cross. Uh, so, cross. and in that in that vertical development is a refining of the 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 relationship between the prior duality. 
So in the transcending of the duality, it's not that the duality disappears, it's just seen for what it is. Indeed. Okay, let's let's talk about let's talk about um toolkits. Let's talk about um how do we resist uh, epigenetic engineering. Right. Um, let's just look at the toolkit and, and and try to equip folks. Well, some of the things that I deal with in in the documentary as to how we're being pushed further towards our selection um, is the destruction of the family. So we're seeing that on every level from the destruction of gender roles to the undermining of the nuclear family, the facilitation of policies and legislation that allows for new different types of familial structures. Um, so toolkit in that sense is um, reaffirming the sacred nature of the family, reaffirming the sacred nature of marriage in its true context, in, in, in the bond between man and woman that's designed to more effectively educate and bring up a child. Um, and I think we're at a point where, where the lack of that should be quite obvious as to the detrimental effect on the youth. And we see this plainly in sort of the black community in some of the poorer areas throughout the United States where, where the single mother is bringing up the children. And we know that this leads to a, a greater instability, uh, a more a predisposition to, to criminal activity, a predisposition to, to mental anguish and so we, we, it's quite clear now that the that the uh, optimum uh, situation for a child to be brought up in is a mother and a father, and there are cosmic rules behind that, and the masculine and feminine, and and, and both both are required. Um, so in that context, mm, redefining and reaffirming uh, the importance of the family and instead of getting lost in meaningless you know um one night stands and and whatnot um being more disciplined with our sexual energy channeling it into the creation of a longer lasting bond which is the 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 most optimum you know thing for for having children if we truly care about our children it's one of the fundamental things we should be trying to offer them so another aspect is hypersexualization we've kind of touched onto this and how everything is you know anything goes everything is is permitted nowadays um so that's very much the r strategy promiscuity um off you know uh, frequent sexual activity so to what point can we can we take our power back okay. to what point do we uh reject these these um these sort of agendas that are being pushed on us uh, to what point do we take our take our sexual power back and not okay. give it freely to anyone and everyone all right no, no i think we've, we've we've stated that sufficiently here and uh, and we're sounding like as though we're moralizing which indeed we in a sense are because um what you're also suggesting is um, a reconstitution of of moral moral framework, which has been systemically um, well. I think what, much of what we call morality is comes from generation upon generation of human beings acting in different ways and finding out the consequence of those different way, means of action. So um, I think the the word morality at times doesn't really get to the root of of. I mean, this doesn't go for all morality, of Indeed. course. You know, morality covers different different things but one aspect that we do term as morality are simply trial and error of our ancestors over a thousand of years to arise at a certain structure that is most productive for our species yeah, and yeah. i think very that, good very good that aspect of morality must be upheld very good okay so my, my takeaway is that um is that we need to become very mindful of of the way in which our primal life force is um, conjured, harnessed, harvested, and directed through attention. Yes. Um, and if each of us become mindful of that, which is really watching the motion of one's own 
footsteps on the ground in one's own journey. So That's pure truth and right action, which I've been um, beating the drum on that simple algorithm for some time. And I think that what, what you've spoken to perfectly underscores the simplicity of that. The algorithm is simple. Um, the path of least resistance to the highest outcome is um, standing in pure truth and conducting right action in the living moment, living as in being actualized and being conscious, being the witness, the perennial witness. So Jason, um, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Lazarus. And I, I rather suspect we'll be doing a, um, a, a director's um, Q&A with, uh, with the audience, if that sits well with you. Absolutely. There were plenty of other aspects that, yeah, we didn't get to touch upon. And there's, it's a very sort of um, deep, deep theme that needs to be unpacked in, in, in other ways. But yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the opportunity to come here and uh, indeed. Uh, the q a as well well thank you so folks that's jason brett searle be sure to uh, watch the film and then we'll invite invite uh, invite you into a q a um session with uh, jason and i and um, maybe do a further deep dive on the subject which is certainly very um keyed into the lazarus initiatives um priority which is really source coding uh, our resurrection individually and and collectively so thanks for for joining us and uh, jason we'll be seeing you again soon thank you thank you very much sasha well how prescient uh, of me to have said that we would be likely seeing this remarkable man again soon indeed i have him in the studio today so here goes Jason Brett Searle. Sir, you are most welcome to the Lazarus Symposium. Hello. The first question, which comes from uh, Abbasi Thoreau, the question is, observing nature as the source of application to change human behavior, Wolf K strategy seems the best. Fierce competitiveness to, to maintain the survival of the fittest and preserve culture, traits, and species. Maybe we should aim for a new strategy, not R, not K. Will we ever achieve it? Do we want to achieve it? <clears throat> well, I think um, I think in a certain sense there are there are universal laws that we're under, and. I see the RK strategy as a manifestation of a universal law rather than something that we can just choose to or choose not to. Um, so, so that being the case, um, the fierce competitiveness of K, so if we're looking at how this manifests in the wolf, the fierce competitiveness, that's not our future. That's not where we want to be headed but nor is the the strategy of the rabbit or the r selected um, uh, species what limits all of these species is that it's purely insti instinctual they have no ability to rationalize or, or consider what they're doing or or think about their own behavior and the great thing that makes us uh, something different something special perhaps is the man the manas it comes from the Sanskrit manas, which is the mind, which is the ability for us to self-reflect on these behaviors. Um, so I think it's having pondered the sort of RK dynamic for some while now, I think perhaps the most productive balance would be sort of 80K, 20R. I mean, obviously there's, this is a very complex issue and I think there are, there are we don't have any metrics yet to, to sort of uh, work more specifically with these ideas. And part of my putting my documentary out there, what I hope to achieve is to get other people thinking down the same lines and, and feeding back into this sort of informational loop of, of, of data and, and, and knowledge so that we can refine our ideas as to what is the most productive balance between the R and K activities. But once again, I think the strategies any sexual strategy implies r and k we need to reproduce we need to have babies do we have lots of babies do we have few babies 
so once again, the, this sort of universal law that we're coming up against, there's no other strategy beyond it, but we can refi refine our knowledge of the strategies and refine our relationship to them. So I think it's more about that. Okay, very good. Next question comes in from the United States. I have noticed in my son's friend group, a racially diverse group of 17 year old boys, there seems to be an outright push against political correctness that looks and feels very rebellious. Is this the balance of which you speak? Is the pendulum beginning to swing in the other direction? Absolutely. Um, I kind of see this as well in my, my eldest son, who's 15. And a lot of the memes and stuff they're, they're sharing um, and, and the YouTubers he follows, they're, they're extremely politically incorrect. And, and it seems like, you know, we touched on in, in the interview, the pendulum swing is, is on its way back. And which is a result of any time anything is, is artificially maintained or art, artificially pushed one way, then nature will rectify it in her own way. And I think we're seeing that as a natural response to this extreme push towards liberalism and the R. Um, and I think the more consciously we do it, the better, as always. The more consciously we can see what we're doing and why, the better for all of us. Beautiful. Thank you. Nicely stated. Um, from Mexico, uh, how can one differentiate uh, between your child being educated or being indoctrinated? Good question. Buenas tardes, México. ¿Cómo están? Um, well, I think the simple metric for that one is, are they being told what to think or are they being told how to think? So I think indoctrination goes on in very, in many subtle ways. It's It's entirely impossible to to completely escape indoctrination we're all indoctrinating people by our own belief systems and predispositions towards certain ideas and so on and so forth but when it comes to education in schools i think if they're given the tools to think for themselves and work things out for themselves and come to their own conclusions and our and our educative um, authorities are happy with the conclusions that they come to through their own use of reason and, and, and the tools they're being given, then great. If they're being given pre-formulated truths that their job is to regurgitate, then we're going down a very dangerous road. And I think that's the clear sort of um, defining factor between, between the two. Don't be telling me what to think. I'm happy to be told how to think or given ideas about what might be, what could be, and uh, and allow the kids to go and go and investigate and, and apply reason and apply the, the God-given gifts that we have to to come to our own uh, conclusions about these things. You know. Okay, very good. I like that. Um, also from the United States, pornography is so readily accessible to people today. Emphasis, kids. Can you talk about how this a hyper stimulation steals the will to strive. Um, isn't it? So it isn't just about sex, right? I mean, it, it makes it foundationally makes people lazy. It removes the creative impetus and drive. Very much so. Um, I think what we're seeing in many different areas of our lives is is, a, is an attempt to rewire the dopamine aspect or, or certain neurotransmitting aspects of the mind. And if, if you can get a dopamine hit from a three minute TikTok video and do that 50 times, then you're not writing the novel you should be writing or you're not delaying those, what what genuine civilization comes out of is the ability to delay our gratification for a big dopamine hit when your novel gets published or or when you see it on the the shelf of the local library 
or you know your work of art is displayed in someone's house or well, these these are the things that have made great civilizations where our ability to say no and i must sacrifice i must put in the time i must not go and you know have some sort of banal enjoyment when i could be you know keeping on purpose and doing what i'm supposed to be doing you know um so so our whole culture is being it's it's undermining the dopamine response system of the brain and um, we need to take that power back and, and we need to start delaying the gratification for greater ends okay sorry we're hearing some weird weird background noises they're not not quite sure no, where they're coming from. okay um open the channel there um christy i'm going to ask another question here which is uh, is it correct that the best way to be um in a reductive sense is to be a k individual with a little bit of r in us and if that's so how is this um best achieved yes indeed and that sort of goes back to my 80 20 sort of principle of of, of a predisposition towards k because k um k creates the stability the stable uh, environment where 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 people can prosper and thrive but the 20 percent r is um is what's needed to keep things from becoming stagnant and stale and um our traditions becoming too rote and our ritualistic sort of way of life becoming too stolid really um so so once again it's this sort of playoff between um you know discipline work and play it's the same sort of things in our everyday lives we have to enjoy ourselves we have to forget about reason we have to play we have to um transcend our day-to-day -day sort of um logical uh, uh, uh predispositions but we must as well work and be disciplined and and if we're to achieve anything so i think it's something that we have to as individuals be brutally honest with ourselves about what works for us and how disciplined we need to be and how playful and and abandoned to discipline we need to be and it's about um you know giving the the, the those both both aspects of ourselves the respect they require and um being more important is being honest with ourselves and not kidding ourselves um into into wasting our time in the play and dismissing the discipline as something we don't need you know okay good uh jason do you see a percentage breakdown of a certain number of those who are awake and is that percentage going to be fairly constant over the next, say, 10 or 20 years? You've mentioned the 80-20 split, but talk about um, constancy over the next 10 to 20 years. What are your thoughts there? Kind of one of those things that depends on the day. I mean, there, 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 is, there are days when you come across some magnificent individual doing spectacular things and your, your hope for humanity and... and uh, great uh, grand awakening and a golden age is just uh, uh, reaffirmed you know and then there's a day where you see too many people um driving alone in their cars with a mask on and you think what the fuck or you know what hope is there for us um so on the whole I'm, I'm pretty optimistic with this and i do think that um even though we're being pushed heavily from the top down into a, a, a a shutting down of our conscious expansion i think um nature finds a way the, the spiral is is will go on whether whether they like it or not there's no power in this universe that can undermine destiny fate or call it what you will so i think um when i look around on the whole 
um, I see a positive vista. I think we're moving into some very interesting places. I think we're, we now have at our disposal all the tools that we need, whether it's free energy devices, um, whether it's um, the ability to create limitless, healthy, organic food, uh, the ability to, you know, tap into primary water sources or there's absolute abundance. We don't need to lack anything. And once we sort of step into this world where these technologies are seeping out, as we're seeing, and I know, Sasha, you're a big part of, of facilitating with this, um, there's you can't put the sort of rabbit back in the bag anymore. It's it's too late. And I think that's the grand sort of crisis that we're facing or that the legacy system is facing right now. And that's why there's so much chaos. That's why there's so much desperation on their part because it's just too late for them. Indeed, thank, thank you for that. Actually, earlier in the, in the Lazarus Symposium today, the first um, 45 minutes was dedicated to showing some of the free energy systems that um, that we're bringing to to bear uh, next year, and um, yeah, curiously enough, 2023 looks as though it is the it is the year um, where we will be able to really um, shatter the uh, source code of the old Atlantean uh, remit. This kind of draconian um, control. Uh, mechanism that's saturated all governments and the high street and um, the legislatures and all the governments around the world and these godless institutions that try to control um, borders and immigration and customs and excise and the postal service and you know just trying to fuck with every single um, transaction that good humans are trying to make it's got to be somehow um, securitized or monetized or flipped into some dirty little coin for some dirty little bureaucracy. Um, and all of that seems to be grinding to a halt. Um, the, the sort of Klaus Schwab um, neo-Nazi um, Sabbatean agenda of the great reset, as he calls it, um, filthy creature that he is, and his um, Davos salamanders, their reset is not uh, coming about. I mean, it is in a sense if we if we remain compelled by the Luciferic images on television screens. So those idiot humans uh, who are not amongst the Lazarus um, symposium audience, but those idiot humans out there, the ones that you alluded to driving around solo with fucking masks on their face. God help the hapless brutes. Um, well beyond the, you know, grasp of redemption, in my view, uh, those creatures, sweet humans, some of them are still lost to themselves, hapless individuals, and almost certainly will be dead within the next two or three years if we're to be blunt about it. People who've taken willfully the genetic intervention um, uh, and, and, and a fallen victim to the status quo, to Cronus, um, won't be enjoying um, the great noble journey ahead. I think we have to be in symposia like this. We can afford to be blunt about the subject and not be coy um, and not speak, um, not speak with this kind of you know, puerile libertarian reverence that we tend to, always trying to have a conversation which doesn't um, offend um, I, I agree with, I think it was David uh, Sarita earlier saying that, you know, we have to step away from this notion that every time we open our mouth and say something, we mustn't offend. Um, yes, we should offend. We should deeply um, offend uh, those things that are worth offending and speak truth. Speaking truth is the highest form of offense, for God's sake. It's always, it's always fashioned, you know, um, the, 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 the newest culture, the newest civilizational wheels tend to begin in a beautiful, positive uh, onset, but we have to break those old patterns. Um, Jason, what is next for you? you you've made this incredible um, documentary. It's a tremendous gift. 
uh, to humanity. And I think that your your research and the work that you do is 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 godly, and I think it matters deeply. I'm interested to know what it is that you're planning next. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, <clears throat> And I appreciate this this platform for getting it out to more people because ultimately, that's um, I'm I'm curious to see how it's. I mean, I'm getting some real positive feedback from people uh, uh, regarding the documentary, and I'm very interested in putting this as a new idea out into the sort of public public conscience and see where it leads to and see. You know, I am one man and I think down my own sort of um, particular idiosyncratic avenues that I have that as an artist and creator, I'm trying to escape as I do so, you know. Um, so to have to have it put into the, the, the psychological framework of other human beings that are completely have different, you know, grasp on different areas of knowledge to me and and them sort of processing it and, and putting forth their own version or, or or ideas upon it, I'm very curious to see what might come out of that. So it's another area where I'm trying to refine my understanding, to refine, you know, like we, we've, we've spoken about the sort of metrics of what would be most uh, profitable for the human being, 80, 20. Um, I'd like to tr try and work on establishing a more uh, a reasonable metric of how do we how do we define how k or how r people are what are we going to take into account what are we going to not take into account i mean there are so many aspects to it it's a very complicated thing so um so yeah on on the one part is is to uh, deepen my understanding of this and and uh to people who might reach out to me as well and, and see what sort of feedback they can bring me. And as for other things, I mean, I'm working on uh, another book that has nothing to do with this at all, but, uh, and there's more documentaries in the pipeline. I mean, there's, there's plenty of different magnificent ideas that are, that are banging around my head and, uh, and I just need the hours in the day to, to put it, put it into writing and, and get it out there. So there's plenty, plenty going on. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for joining us. I don't have any further questions from the audience in front of me. I'm very, very grateful that you made the time to, to come in today. And, um, and just finally, as we sign off, where can people find you today? Um, I'd ask anyone interested to go to the Maybug Productions YouTube channel. That's pretty much where, where I get out to people um there's personal contact email there on my channel information um so if you're interested please subscribe that helps the channel um there's a backup on rumble so i'm not quite sure how long this this film will last on youtube i've already had issues with youtube i think i've got maybe a couple of strikes already so it might be if the, if you see the channel disappears then go out go check out maybug on on the rumble um and yeah any comments any feedback i'm very interested in hearing about it and if there's any you know a few, a few people have reached out to me personally via the email as well and I've, I've been put in touch with some very interesting people that way um so by all means share the documentary if you think it's it's uh, beneficial to you i'd like this um dialogue to 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 expand i'd like it to reach more people and and generate some sort of uh, back and forth so yeah thank you beautiful and um i do want to ask you um i don't if, I, I don't think i asked this to you even in conversation but one of my favorite questions of uh, of great minds and hearts is to ask them um the great perennial um banquet in the sky um, who would you invite to that banquet? Who are your icons, historical, well, living or dead, actually? Um, who would you populate at your ultimate dinner party? Just name three or four, three or four iconic guests, the greatest minds and hearts that you can uh, that you can draw upon in your imagining. Wow. Um... There's so many. I mean, I'd have I'd have a massive party going on, I think, because there's there's so many greats. Um, 
I, I would say most of them have passed on. Um, so there would be religious figures from Nisagadad to Maharaj or Shankaracharya or, or Mahavira, who was the, the, the 24th sort of and final founder of Jainism, which interests me deeply, deeply. Um, Alistair Crowley, I would really like to know what that guy was about because I've spent uh, many years reading his works from sort of my early 20s when, when I discovered him. And I just think he's a fascinating, extremely eclectic person that, that uh, you know, seems to be uh, misinterpreted by everyone. I don't know my version of Alistair Crowley. I, I've never heard anyone really talk about him in the same way that I that I see him. But I've read him extensively. And, um, you know, there was a period in my early 20s when I was deep into him where he'd be in my dreams and we'd have these back and forths. And, and I felt very much connected to him. Um, Dr. John Lilly, he'd have to be there, um, who was very famous for his work with communicating with dolphins. But he was also the, the inventor of the isolation tank and did a lot of work with LSD and ketamine. And, um, Terence McKenna, I mean, what a great, what a great elocutor, um, and what a fantastic mind, and and what what amazing ideas came out of that man. Um, so there would be religious, great religious figures, uh, great philosophers. Socrates would have to be there. Um, so so yeah, it, there'd be a lot a lot going on and a lot. To, we'd have to be there for a month solid just to get over the initial sort of you know introductions i think all right well you just uh you just robbed me of mine was of course well everyone my, my audience know that my favorite all-time um creature was socrates i'm deeply deeply in love with uh, with socrates so he would be my he would be my living on a desert island for a thousand years compadre and would you know probably just sit there with the uh, toes um toes together just having a conversation under the one palm tree for an eternity endlessly inquiring on the nature of inquiry or something abstruse like that but Gurdjieff would definitely be at my dinner table <laughs> I mean you have to have a drinker and a smoker at the table um Kermit the Frog absolutely I, I don't think any banquet in the sky would be replete without Kermit the Frog and um, and my my great uh, amour would be um, Sophie, the goddess of wisdom, um, without any question of doubt. That brings us to the end of our beautiful discourse. Thank you, Jason Brett Searle. Thank you for all that you are and all that you be. And I look forward to taking this conversation with you further in the days ahead. Thank you, brother. Much love to you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Nice talking to you.